Good morning, Grace people. Good, morning. Good to be with you today as we continue on our journey. It's a long one. It's a long journey going to carry us all throughout the year. We're titling this journey Route 66. It's our journey through all 66 books of the Bible, but we're not actually going to be in all 66 books. It's a journey that's covering the big story, God's big story. But I will tell you, we're into the second month of this, and we've gone through Genesis and Exodus, the first two books. So at this rate, give us five years, and, uh, and we'll get to the end. Uh, no, you, it, we'll, you'll see we're going to kind of accelerate, but there's a reason why we've spent so much time in Genesis and Exodus. It's because so much that happens in these two first books of the Bible is just foundational to understanding the big story there's story after story, family after family, God interacting with the humanity that he has created. It's so central to who we are. And last week as we continued on this journey, we were introduced to a real key character of the Bible. His name is Moses, and he shows up again and again and again all throughout the history of Israel and all throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And this book that we're in right now, this second book known as Exodus, the story of what happens to God's people through the ministry of Moses and in this very key chapter of life is a story that is central to the whole story of Scripture. The idea of God coming and rescuing his people. Let me see if I can bring you up to speed a little bit from last week. Last week, we're introduced to Moses, and Moses is introduced to God. God introduces himself to Moses. He appears in the burning bush revealing himself to Moses and letting Moses know something, that he had heard the cries of his people, the cries of his people who were in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. And not only did he hear, but he cares. And not only does he care, but he's going to rescue them. He is going to intervene on their behalf to rescue them and be with them, present in their lives. And Moses is going to be his mouthpiece. So Moses makes his way down to Egypt. This is kind of a quick covering of the story from where we were last week to this week. Moses goes down to Egypt with his brother Aaron to speak on God's behalf to Pharaoh, God on earth in the eyes of the Egyptians, to declare to them that it's time to let God's people go. Pharaoh rejects this message, and as a result, a whole series of curses come upon the land. And we hear them articulated throughout the chapters of Exodus. Many different curses, many different plagues, all kinds of things. Poisoned water, gnats, boils, plagues, flies, all kinds of things. Frogs! All of these things occurring again and again and again. And here's the thing that we sometimes miss. Not only would those plagues have impacted the Egyptians, but everybody who was within the land, including God's people. They were witnessing this. They were enduring the same kind of, of difficulties. They saw it while it was happening around them. This has to be pretty traumatic to see all of this occurring in the land that you are in. And one after another after another until finally it comes towards the end and a last curse is unleashed on the land. A curse that would claim the lives of the firstborn of everyone within Egypt. Unless... A sacrifice is made. And the blood of that sacrifice is put on the doorposts of the homes, in which case then this curse of death would pass over that home and continue on. That's where we get that term Passover from. And after this occurs, finally Pharaoh relents and says, Go, leave. And God's people gather up what they have as well as gathering up a lot of what the Egyptians had and take it with them and make their journey out. And as they make their journey out, there is great rejoicing. There's a whole chapter of, of the Song of Miriam rejoicing over what it is that God has done. There is victory. They are excited. They are happy. They feel blessed. And they make their way out into the wilderness. And that's where we pick up the story one and a half months later in chapter 16. Follow along with me in Exodus chapter 16 if you'd like in your own Bibles or just listen along as I read. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, 
the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the morning, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, Thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they had needed. A month and a half, that's all it took for God's people to go from celebrating to grumbling. Grumbling and complaining. And not only grumbling and complaining, but starting to get a distorted idea of what life was really like beforehand. It's interesting to, to look at this story and to, to, to glean into it what is really going on. There's, there's a story of the prior land or the previous land and a story of the promised land. And in the previous land, at least in the eyes of the Israelites... Life wasn't so bad. I mean, there were pots full of meat all the time. All we did was sit around and be grateful to Pharaoh for providing these full meals that we got to sit around and enjoy. Really? <laughs> That's what you remember? That's how you think it was? And they grumbled and they complained. Now, I am not God. I know that may come as a surprise to some of you. <laughs> but if I were, what would my response be to the grumbling of those whom you have just rescued from 400 years of slavery? I don't think it would be this. I think of my own children. We've taken some family trips together, family journeys. You know, you're used to having your kids at home. You feed them the meals. You put the things together. But then, then you go on a big trip. You go on a big, exciting trip to a place like Disney World. I brought my family along to Disney World. Great trip. Expensive trip. <laughs> and one of the nights there, we had a special meal. We went to Epcot, and we went to Norway in Epcot. Right? Because I'm a Viking. And we went, and we gathered there together for that meal. And everybody was so excited, except for one. 
I will not say their name, but they were not happy at all with the food that was provided in Norway. And they made it known that they were not happy with the food that was provided in Norway. Oh yes, child, we've brought you to this enchanted land. We have spent thousands of dollars to bring you to this enchanted land. And all you wish to do is complain. And was my response to them, oh dear child, let me provide more. Let me give you exactly what it is that you want at night and in the morning. No. I was not happy with them. Yet here we see God and his response to their grumbling isn't even to acknowledge the grumbling, but simply to say, here is how I will provide for you. I think it's because God understands something about us and understands something specific about the dear people of Israel. 400 years of living in this land. 400 years, generation after generation, of getting used to things, of growing accustomed to what it was like to live as slaves, what it was like to know that everything that they had, they relied upon the good graces of Pharaoh. They relied upon his power to give them what they needed as basic sustenance to live, to provide some version of protection and safety with their armies and with roofs over their head, to give them consistency and a place to stay. It reminds me a lot of, of the story in one of my favorite movies, The Shawshank Redemption. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie. But there's a character in that movie by the name of Brooks. And Brooks has been imprisoned in Shawshank prison almost his entire life. And he's gotten used to it. And he knows the rhythm of the place. And he knows his role. And he knows what he is there to do. And then one day the news comes that he is going to be set free. And what is his response? He becomes violent and seeks to find a way to stay. Why? Because in that amount of time, freedom becomes frightening. Because even under the cruel hands of those who were oppressing them, they had become accustomed to this way of life. So as they stepped into this new place, the new place was like a halfway house. You see, they weren't into the promised land yet. They were in this present land. And this present land was a wilderness. And this wilderness did not look like the previous land, and it didn't sound like the promised land. And when you don't know what the promised land is, is going to be when you're not sure if you're going to get there where all you have is a promise, you go back to what you know and what feels comfortable. And in that place, God provides. In that wilderness, God provides generously and graciously. Not because they deserved it, but because God chose to reveal what his heart is towards us, towards a broken humanity, even a humanity that longed to be back in the bondage of which they had previously lived. God gets it, and yet he still provides vision and provision. Provision every night, Every evening at the end of one day and as a new day began in the darkness, the quail would come and the meat would be provided. And not only that, but it says that a pillar of fire would guide them at night. Fire, that symbol of protection, that symbol of light in the darkness so that you can see it keeps away the wolves, it keeps away the wildlife that would want to come and consume you in the darkness. Food to eat and something to see and protect you by. That's God's provision and vision. And then the next morning they would go out 
And as the sun was just preparing to rise, there would be a dew that had settled over the desert floor. And as that dew dissipated, it left behind manna. Now you notice the word manna doesn't actually show up here much in this passage. That's because manna, when translated from Hebrew, means what is it? And every morning they would see, what is it? And Moses reminds them, it's God's provision for you. There it is, bread in the morning for you to gather. And it'll be there every day, just enough for that day. There was the provision. What about the vision? A cloud. A cloud in the sky. What could that cloud symbolize? If you've ever been in a stark place where it's hot and the sun beats on you, a cloud is exactly what you're hoping for. Something to provide some shade, something that shows that there's moisture, that there's the possibility that there could be water. That's the vision. God gives vision and provision to his people in the wilderness. You know, in a lot of ways, I feel like we're in that in-between place too. And in a lot of ways, our human responses are very similar to the responses that we see in this passage. We talk about what life was like before, right? We hear about it. Oh, you remember before the pandemic? Remember before all the social unrest? You remember before all the political division? You remember before? Oh, wasn't it good back then? <laughs> I get together with a group of pastors. We just all gather together for our annual gathering of LCMC. And, and one of the things that pastors always ask each other, because it's just a common question, how's your congregation? So how many do you have in worship? And here's the thing, we're still in the mode where every single time that question is asked, the first response is, well, you know, we used to worship this. And now we're worshiping this. There's always a comparison between before and after. And the before is always a bigger number. And the before always has us longing back to, oh, remember the good old days. But you see, we do that generation after generation, don't we? We look back upon things with kind of a romantic view, a nostalgic view of how, how good things were before. Hey, there were challenges before, friends. Every generation has faced them. But when we come into the present after something that has been as traumatic for our whole culture as this is, we come into this place right now, and sometimes in the present place that feels like wilderness, there comes a lot of grumbling. How come we're not doing it like we did before? Why can't we just get back to the way things used to be? Oh, man, things were so much better back then. Remember when gas was 15 cents a gallon? No, I don't. Remember when eggs were 10 cents a dozen? No, I don't. But yet we, we long for those kinds of things. We envision those times and those places, and we, we forget about all the difficulties and the challenges that were there too. And we know of God's promise. We know of God's promise to provide. We know of God's promise to make things right when God will return in Jesus Christ to set everything right. But we don't live there yet, do we? So instead, we live in the present and the present today, maybe more than in a long time, feels like a wilderness. People are struggling. The provision that they hope for looks harder and harder to come by. And the vision and outlook into the future looks bleak and unforgiving and uncertain. But in those places... God still shows his grace. Even as we grumble, even as we mumble, God's grace still shows up. We do have a vision here at Community of Grace. We want to see grace in every corner of our community, but that's hard to see right now, isn't it? It's hard to see that right now because there's a lot of other things that we see instead. 
What are you seeing right now in the corners of our community? Both within our congregation, but in our broader community, the place where we have been set. I want you just to think about it for a minute. What are some words that come to mind in your mind? You don't have to say them out loud, but think of what those words are. What are you seeing in the community right now? I can think of some words that come to my mind. Words like division, pain, brokenness, hunger, anger, sadness, frustration. So many of these things are easy to see in the corners of our community right now. Yet God calls us to see grace in those places. So what would grace look like as it meets every one of those words? Where there's pain, grace brings healing. Where there's hunger, grace brings food. Where there's division, grace brings unity. Where there's brokenness, grace brings wholeness and holiness. Can we see it? Only if we receive it first. And God is gracious to show his grace in your corner and in your life first if we will only receive it. This picture is the picture of Jesus, the graciousness of God. What does grace ultimately mean? It means unmerited favor. It means when God chooses to show up and show his abundance, whether we deserve it or not, which we don't, but he does. He shows us that anyway if we have hearts to receive it. So we can acknowledge the uncertainty. We can talk honestly about what we're seeing with our natural eyes right now, but then we must move forward to a place of faith and hope, and that is a gift of God's grace. We start by receiving the grace that we need each day. We pray it together, don't we, in the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. There's enough. There'll be enough for today. And where you don't see it, may God bring someone else to you to share it with you. Because this beautiful picture of their being those gathering each day what they needed. Some gathered much, others gathered little, but when it all came out in the end, those who gathered much didn't have too much. Those who gathered little didn't have too little. Well, how does that work? If you gathered much, shouldn't you have more than somebody else who gathers little? Not when you share it. Not when you look to be a generous part of God's grace. Freely you have received, now freely give. When you receive that grace and receive what you need for the day, and you look around to your brothers and sisters, and you look and you say, is that somebody who needs some favor from God today? Let me share what's been given to me. Maybe you're in that place of feeling that abundance of God's grace. What a wonderful gift that is. Maybe you're in a place of feeling like your tank is pretty low. What a wonderful gift it is to be a part of a community because that's the place where God can show his blessing. That's the place where God can show his grace is through one another. That's being a community of grace. I want to invite you to come this evening. The only agenda tonight is for us to be together in God's grace to listen to the Holy Spirit and to listen to one another about what God is showing us in vision and provision for the future. 
We don't have it all figured out. Don't expect coming a great presentation from your senior pastor to tell you the great vision that I've received from the top of the mountain because it's not coming. What's coming is an opportunity for us to come together and listen and hear what God is doing in you so that we can share it together and hear together what God is doing. And then we'll let God reveal the vision and the provision as we chart our way forward. But just come tonight. Enjoy a family meal. Hey, it's free food. (laughs) And then come enjoy some free conversation. It's good to be God's family and trust in his gracious provision in our lives. So let's live into that today. And let's receive from God what he has for us in this moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come together in this place, we are a people who need. Lord, even in the times and places where we don't think we do, we have need, Lord. And you are the one who is the great provider and are generous and abundant in the way that you pour out your love and your life into our lives. Lord, forgive us for those times where we have compared too much to the past or have believed that the good old days were so much better than they are today or that the future is so dark and bleak or that the present offers no opportunity. Lord, help us in those places, Lord, to simply open our hands and receive the daily bread that you desire to give to us We live in that promise that there will be enough for today. There will be enough to share. There's enough grace to go around, Lord. Help us to see it, to receive it, to share it, and to bring it out into this community that desperately needs it. Thank you, Lord, for being so generous towards us even when we grumble. We love you. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen.